Hey everybody, so thank you so much for inviting me into your home again this, this afternoon. I hope everybody is safe and well. Um, I think this is such an important topic just because it is so and hot out there still. And as you guys know, I work in a surgical unit and I can't tell you how many of my patients come back with dehydration to the point where they have to go to the ER and have IV hydration. It's really a very dangerous situation. So I wanted to talk about not just the dangers, but some of the strategies and solutions that we can do to prevent dehydration because really prevention is really what we have to do. So I'm going to talk about causes of dehydration, which I, I'm sure we know about, but let's just talk about some of those reminders. Some symptoms of dehydration, and some of these symptoms actually might be subtle. I don't want to wait until you're passing out on the street. I want you to be able to recognize some subtle signs that you are approaching dehydration. So you can say, you know what, I got to get a drink of water. I have to get a you know, drink of tea right now. And then talk about some strategies. I have some recipes in here. So let's have fun. All right, so what exactly is the definition of dehydration? Well, the medical definition of dehydration is it's a condition where we take in less fluids or a condition where we're losing excessive fluids. Um, it certainly is a double whammy when both conditions occur at the same time. And sometimes that's what I see, unfortunately, in my practice. So especially, say, a surgical patient where you might be in pain, you might be healing, you just don't feel very well, you're not really thinking about drinking, and then you're also healing and maybe losing fluids as well. And that's just, you know, double whammy. So the human body is made up of mostly water when we look at it. And, and of course, as we age, we're losing muscle mass, we're losing you know, body surface area. So that's why the percentage of water actually decreases as we get older. But when you, when you look at these numbers, I mean, we're still at least 50% water, right? And this just shows you what organs really are, hold most of the water. So the brain and the heart, that would make sense. The lungs, that makes sense too, because that's where um, gases are exchanged. So the lungs are very moist, so they need a lot of moisture. Um, that's why when my dad lived in Vegas, oh my gosh, I couldn't even breathe just with that hot air. I can definitely breathe better here in Florida with the humidity. So even though my hair looks crazy, at least my lungs feel a little bit better. Um, the kidneys, that, those are the filtration organs, so that would make sense, about 79% of water. Your muscles, 79%. So that's why as you build muscle, you're actually going to hold more water. And I know my patients that are trying to lose weight, they kind of freak out a little bit because they get on the scale and say, oh my gosh, I'm going to the gym. Why, why is the scale going up? And I just try to explain to them that the higher the muscle, the higher the water content as well. And all of that is heavy. Your bones about 31% and your skin about 64%. What does water do though? You know, water is necessary for almost every single bodily function. So it's going to, it, you know, when you look at the digestive system, it helps to convert food for digestion and absorption. When you think of the urinary system, it helps to waste, uh, you know, flush the waste and make urine. When you think about the brain and, and the hormones, it makes hormones. It keeps all the mucous membranes very moist. Remember, the mucous membranes are those membranes that line the respiratory tract and also the urinary tract and reproductive tract. And especially now during COVID, we want to make sure that your mucous membranes are very healthy because that's that's one of those uh, immune barriers against those creepy crawlies. So, you, you know, you want to drink water to keep them moist. Um, water helps to transmit oxygen and CO2. Um, every single cell of your body has some sort of water in it. So imagine if we don't drink water, it's not going to be very good for us. Um, my patients that are actually weight. Actually, when you drink water, that also helps to lose weight as well because it kind of increases that thermogenesis of digestion. So just keep that in mind. If you are trying to lose weight, increase your water. That'll actually help too. So what are the causes of dehydration? Well, some of the obvious stuff, right? So if you're having vomiting or diarrhea, you're losing excessive fluids, that could lead to dehydration. If you have some sort of illness, if you, you know, if you have the flu or you're getting over a cold, if you have fever, infections, that all um, increases body temperature, which is going to demand more fluid. So if it 
you're going to dehydrate. Um, if you have less motivation to drink, I know as we get older, we kind of lose our taste for fluids. Sometimes we forget to drink. Um, sometimes even we, we don't tolerate certain fluids. I have some patients that say to me that they can't really drink water all that well um, just because it feels very heavy. It actually hurts their stomach. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can uh, change water, kind of change the molecular um, Com composition, I guess you could say, of water to make it a little bit easier to drink. If you have um, certain conditions like diabetes or um, chronic renal failure, things like that, that also increases um, how much the risk of dehydration. Obviously, if you're exerting yourself and you're perspiring, maybe doing some gardening or golfing or tennis and you're perspiring, you're obviously losing fluids. Um, of course, in these extreme temperatures, both hot and cold, actually. Um, as we get older, like I said, uh, we lose our ability to retain water just because we're changing our body composition, especially our muscle mass. Those of us on certain medications, I'm actually going to go through a list of medications with you, um, that actually some of them can increase um, fluid out put like diuretics and things like that. And of course, small children and infants. So your grandkids, they're going to be losing waters really quick. So we got to watch out for them. Now, these are the symptoms of dehydration. Some of them are pretty obvious, but some of them might not be. So if you're not really urinating all that much, you know, it's been all day and it's three o'clock in the afternoon, you're like, oh, I think I have to go pee now. Well, that's a really long time without urinating. So you could actually be dehydrated. And when you do have a urination, just take a look at the and the odor. Um, and the darker it is and the more pungent smelling it is, is going to indicate if you have dehydration because urine has a bunch of electrolytes and salts and solutes. So if it you know, doesn't have enough water to the urine, it's going to be very concentrated. Dry mouth or throat, dry eyes, um, no tears. Like if, even if you yawn, you know how you yawn? and then you, you know you get teary-eyed if that doesn't happen that might be an indication of fatigue now that's an interesting one because that is actually a symptom of dehydration it's not necessarily just because you didn't sleep well or your blood sugar is dropping it could actually be dehydration extreme thirst but that's kind of because i have some patients that don't even feel thirsty at all and yet they can become dehydrated um, headache confusion, dizziness, or lightheadedness. So these are some of the symptoms of dehydration. Now, complications of dehydration, there are actually many. There's more than this, but heat stroke is what really worries me, especially if you're playing golf or tennis outside or going for a walk or just hanging out in a hot climate. Um, heat stroke can really sneak up on you and you know, you're going to end up in the ER. Um, kidney stones, got to remember that too. You know, things that we eat, things that we drink, Um, medications, everything has to be. And if you become dehydrated, certain solutes and particulates can pretty much make a stone. And I don't know if you've ever had a kidney stone before, but it is not very pleasant. So we want to keep our kidneys very healthy. Um, same thing with the urinary tract. Remember, the urinary tract, you know, um, can, can be very susceptible to bacterial infection. So the more we can drink and the more we can pee, that's a good thing because we're getting out the bacteria that can cause UTIs. And then constipation, which is, you know, not comfortable. Um, it can be dangerous in some instances. I have um, quite a few experiences with my patients who ended up in the ER um, impacted because they just didn't drink enough fluids. And now, unfortunately, the fecal matter is getting stuck. I don't mean to be rude, but that's what happens with extreme constipation. So how can dehydration actually be life-threatening? Well, it can cause confusion, and that would be pretty scary, especially if you're driving. Um, fainting, um, you could get a fever. Um, kidney failure, like I said. Uh, rapid heartbeat or increased heart rate just because your heart is trying to compensate for, you know, um, the confusion and the lightheadedness. So it's trying to um, compensate for that. And if you have a weak heart or if you have history of heart attack, you're going to put yourself at risk of another. Um, you can get seizures because of the electrolyte imbalances. So even if you never had a seizure before, that's not in your medical history. 
doesn't mean that we can ever get one. So be careful. Uh, rapid breathing, now you're becoming hypoxic. You could go into shock and believe it or not, you can die from be being dehydrated. And believe me, I've seen patients pretty close to that. So what tests to determine dehydration if God forbid actually, you know, rush to the ER? How would the doctor actually determine that you might be dehydrated? Well, they might take a lab test and take a look at something called the CBC, which is your complete blood count, because they might want to make sure you don't have any kind of underlying infection. So they're going to look at your white blood cells and your red blood cells. They're also going to do something called the CMP, the complete metabolic panel, which actually also looks at your kidney function. So so they're going to look at your blood urea, nitrogen, your glomerular filtration rate, your creatinine. I know those are all fancy words. What that means is they're looking at your kidney function. So if your is really sluggish, they're going to know that your kidneys are really not functioning all that well. Um, again, because I work in the surgical department, that's one thing, right? Whenever you leave the, the hospital after surgery, what, what do the nurses always want you to do? They want you to pee. They want to make sure that that... Uh, is working and functioning. Um, and then the electrolytes. Remember, what are the electrolytes? Sodium, potassium, chloride. What do these electrolytes do? They are extremely important for nerve transmission and muscle contraction. And don't forget, your heart is a muscle. So if you have an imbalance of this potassium and sodium, you can get into um, an AFib, you can get into tachycardia, which means your heart is you know, fibrillating and beating too fast. So very, very dangerous. Um, nurses and doctors will take your vital signs. Sometimes the blood pressure, sometimes it actually might be too low with dehydration as well. And of course, your heart rate. Um, they might want to try to get a urinalysis, but if you're dehydrated, you might not be outputting any urine. So prevention is definitely the key. Let's try to prevent some of these things before it happens. We don't want you to end up in the ER. Um, by the time you end up in the ER, Hydration, um, you're not going to be able to drink enough. You're going to have to be hooked up to an IV and probably with some electrolytes, and it's it's unpleasant, definitely not fun. So this looks a lot more fun than IV, if you ask me. Look how nice these look. So I have patients that say to me, "Look, I don't really like water. I don't like the taste of it, you know, or it hurts my stomach. It's just not, you know, unappealing to me." So we need to jazz up our water. So one of the best ways that you can do that is just make it infused with some sort of flavor. And what's nice about that is, you know, you can control what flavor you want to make it by deciding what kind of fruit or vegetables or herbs you might want to throw in that water. And what's nice too is that, you know, the, the, you can get it on a want to go to the store, you can buy some of those infused water containers that make it so easy. They're compartmentalized, so you can put all the fruit and vegetables on one side, and then it just infuses the flavor into the water. And what it actually does, you look at the chemistry of it, it actually softens the water. Um, we're going to talk about alkaline water in a second, but, you know, water is H2O, and there might be some chemists out there, and it's kind of a heavy molecule, plus it has all these other contaminants in it and fluoride and all these things, so it's kind of heavy. You want to soften it up a little bit and change the pH a little bit, so when you add your fruits and vegetables, herbs, it will naturally do that, and you might actually have better tolerance for it. If you do make an infused water, remember it's not going to last forever because you put some, you know, other things in it. So it'll last approximately two to three days in the refrigerator. If you do leave your water bottle out with the infused water um, and it's out in the sun, I would chuck it and get rid of it. Um, just because remember that fruits, vegetables, herbs, they're not really sterile, even though you've washed it. And when you put it in the water, if it's out in the, in the heat and it's outside, all day, it can actually start to, you know, breed bacteria. These are just some fun recipes that I looked up. You know, it all depends on what your flavor profile that you like. Uh, you know, strawberry, basil, lemon, that always seems like a good combination. Um, and, you know, all these recipes are basically just add as much water as you want and ice cubes and make it as strong as you want. Throw in more basil if you like the taste of basil, throw in more lemon if you like. 
Here's another one with honeydew, cucumber, and mint. That just seems like such a nice combination as well. You know, cucumber is very clean tasting and very fresh and very, you know, refreshing. Um, mint gives it that nice, almost like a sweet tone, so you don't have to add any sugar. Blackberries, orange, and ginger. Well, of course, ginger is one of my favorite herbs anyway, so um, that goes with you know, everything coconut and lime those sound good too and what's kind of fun about the infused water is that you can always put it in ice cube trays after you make it and and then you just pop those into another pitcher of water so you can kind of keep keep having that flavor it's really nice and very refreshing how about this one watermelon kiwi and lime Oof, i think i'm getting hungry mango raspberry and ginger so they're just a lot of fun. I, I would say just play around with it. Whatever flavor profile you like, go for it. Also, if you don't really feel like making yourself, what's nice is that the food industry has responded and created a lot of the hint has been out for a long time. Um, now it's pretty popular and other companies have come out with flavored waters. Some of them have carbonation, some of them don't have carbonation. Um, you know, I don't think carbonation is the greatest thing. Um, and nutrition standpoint, I don't like carbonation just because if you have reflux, be careful with carbonation because that can worse. So um, just be careful with that. Gosh, there's so many different brands out there. And what's fun about these is that they're already concentrated in a liquid form. So you don't have to sit there and stir it and stir it and stir it. It's actually going to dissolve pretty quick. Um, a lot of them, some of them use real sugar, some of them use sugar substitutes. So you're going to have to just read the labels to see, you know, what your philosophy is if you want as sugar or something that's sugar free or um, maybe some of the sugar you just have to read the label but the good thing is that there are so many that you can choose from now i just wanted to mention something about the sports drinks and the electrolyte waters um, you know they're they're really really handy to have but i don't want you to drink them just as a beverage um, just because remember they do have electrolytes in them and if you do have high blood pressure that you're being treated for remember they do have sodium in them so treat the sports drinks and the electrolyte water almost like medicine um, if you're out playing golf or you're sweating or you're gardening then that's when you'd want to drink them but you know just as a beverage you know I wouldn't do that. And it's the same thing with your grandkids or your kids. Um, you know, they really market some of these flavors to kids. And it's okay if they're out on the soccer field to have it. But just, you know, just when they're hanging out at home watching TV, it's not really something that I really promote. If you have diarrhea, if you have vomiting, certainly if you have any kind of sickness, then that would be okay too. This is just a recipe stuff you know they don't want to buy the stuff um, they want to have more control about what's in it so this is just how you can make your own homemade Gatorade um, it starts out with the water of course you have some salt and baking soda um, or you can use um, this salt substitute Mrs. Dash is a salt substitute that actually uses potassium instead of sodium. So if you ever get into a situation where you need potassium because, you know, maybe you are vomiting or dehydrated or maybe you're on furosemide or Lasix, things like that, you can actually do a little cheat here and add your own potassium salt to your water or your food. And then just to make it taste a little bit better, you might want to put some sort of flavor packet in there because let me tell you, water with baking soda in it does so good. I did want to mention um, something called alkaline water because I do have a lot of um, clients and patients that want to drink it. And there are some claims that alkaline water might be healthier for us. So I just wanted to review that a little bit. So what exactly is alkaline water? Well, when you look at um, fluids of the body, um, they, they are of a certain pH scale. And pH means how much acidity or alkalinity that particular fluid is. So just to give you an example, your stomach, 
because it's responsible for digestion of food is very, very acidic because it has hydrochloric acid. So it's, you know, it's a one, a pH of one. I mean, literally, if you put your finger in your stomach, not that anyone can ever do that, but if we did, we would burn our finger off. That's how strong that stomach acid is. Um, and then as you move down the line a little bit, blood is about a alkaline neutral is in the seven range and that kind of makes sense we don't want to have acidic blood right because that would cause organ damage so when you look at various foods and various beverages they're going to have different acidity and alkalinity um, and I know even some TV commercials even talk about it, you know, the toothpaste commercials, how a lot of those acidic foods that we eat and drink actually wear away the enamel of our teeth. And that kind of makes sense to me. So there is some talk about how if we drink water that's a little bit more alkaline than neutral, that it actually poses some sort of health benefit. So let's kind of see if that's true. You can actually buy alkaline water over the counter now. Um, and a lot of times they'll tell you what the pH is. So like this one, for example, tells you it's a pH of 9.5. This one is a nine. This one is probably an 8.8. .8. There you go, it's right in front of my face. And this one probably says it too, just can't see it on the slide. So going back to here, the most alkaline would be 14. Of course, we don't wanna go that far. Um, that's, you know, Drano basically, ammonia solution. So right around this range right here, seven, eight, nine. That's really what the alkaline water is trying to produce. So the research is showing that, and it is limited research, so I can't say that this proves anything, but it's, it's kind of interesting. There was a study um, that showed that the alkaline water actually deactivated something called pepsin to help reduce the acid reflux. Now, what exactly is pepsin? Well, pepsin is kind of a, an enzyme that's activated in our stomach whenever we eat proteins, especially because we have to those proteins. But those of us that suffer from acid reflux or heartburn or GERD actually, you know, find a lot of that to be very burning and it causes issues. So there's some limited research that if you're drinking alkaline water, it, it um, deactivates that pepsin so you don't get that burny, acidy kind of feeling. Um, there's another study, again limited, that showed that when you drink alkaline water, especially after your workout, that it produces less cardiovascular strain because it helps to increase the oxygenation of your tissues. So you're less fatigued, you're, you know, you're oxygenating your tissues, you know, um, pretty energetic. Um, there's another study, this one was kind of interesting too, that drinking water might be better for your bones to prevent osteoporosis because it prevents something called bone resorption. And what bone resorption is, is your bones are constantly breaking down to build up and breaking down to build up. And the reason is we constantly have to have calcium in our blood. Calcium is a mineral that's really important, not just for bones and teeth, but it's needed for blood clotting, nerve transmission, and muscle contraction. So our body and our blood constantly has to have calcium. So if you're not eating it or drinking it or taking a supplement, well, it's gonna find it from somewhere and it's gonna find it from the bone. So drinking alkaline water is supposed to protect your bones. There's another short study that showed that it helped to lower blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol after drinking it for three to six months. So it's, it's very interesting. These studies are just preliminary. They don't prove anything. Um, but I think just, just showing, showing that we can change the pH of the water if it makes it more tolerable and you can actually drink it to prevent dehydration and then get some of these other health benefits, I think that could be a good thing. The only thing though, you have to be careful if you do have any kind of kidney disease, any kind of chronic renal failure, if you're on dialysis, um, I don't recommend drinking alkaline water um, just because it is your kidneys and your lungs that actually activate and control the pH of your body. So if you have kidney issues and you drink alkaline water, you can get into something called metabolic alkalosis. And what that means is that the pH of your and your fluids in your body are going too high. And that would actually be very dangerous for you. So that's just a a little disclaimer here, if you do have kidney issues, just stick to regular, you know, bottled water.
Now, this is just a recipe for homemade alkaline water if you don't want to buy it. Um, this is actually from the Canadian Society of Intestinal Research. You could actually make it yourself by mixing a half a teaspoon of baking soda um, in four fluid ounces of water. And um, this is actually a treatment for uh, heartburn, too. Or you could do one third of a teaspoon of baking soda in eight fluid ounces of purified water. But oh, it tastes terrible. <laughs> That sometimes makes me gag. Um, one eighth tablespoon of lemon juice, which almost sounds counterintuitive because you think, well, that doesn't even make sense. Lemon juice is so acidic. But when you put this acidic medium, which is very little anyway, in the AO, then it actually makes it into an alkaline. So it's all about chemistry. You can buy different products out there, pH booster drops, so you can you know, put your own drops in your own water. Um, some of us might have some water filtration systems or water ionizers that actually change the water. So just something to consider. The other thing though, is that you know, water and dehydration and you know, fluids don't just come in the fluid fluid. It also comes in the form of food. Um, so when you're looking at different foods, they might have different percentages of fluid in it that could also help to hydrate us. So when you're looking at cucumbers, and what's so nice about cucumbers is if, if you have leftover, you can make infused water. <laughs> so you've got cucumbers, iceberg lettuce. You know, a lot of people will say to me, oh, iceberg lettuce is such a waste of time. It has no nutrition. Well, actually, it kind of does. It gives you a lot of water and it gives you some fiber. So I'm totally okay with iceberg lettuce. Um, celery, radishes, tomatoes, green peppers, cauliflower, this kind of makes sense, right? These are fruits and vegetables. So it would make sense that it's giving you water. So, um, you know, hey, count this towards your, um, all right, you have to eat a lot of cucumbers to really make a big difference. But I think the point here is at least you're eating um, moisturizing food. And that would be a good thing too, to add to your diet. The other thing you should just consider too is, you know, carry a water bottle with you for easy access. I think the problem is if it's not in front of us, we get or, oh, it's a pain in the neck. I have nothing and I don't want to stop at the store to get something. Carry a small little water bottle in your bag or, you know, certainly when we're going to the gym or the tennis court, we have that anyway. But even if you're going to the store for the day, try to carry something with you. Um, I always like to freeze a bunch of bottles just because it'll stay colder longer. Um, freezing your fruit and vegetables, that's also another way that you can enhance the hydration of that particular food. Um, stick everything into ice cube trays. I know of these modern refrigerators, you know, you have the automatic ice machines, but <laughs> go get some of those ice cube trays from the dollar store because they're really, really helpful. And then I just wanted to talk about the intake of your caffeine, sodium, and alcohol. So let's just mention that a little bit. So let's first define what is excessive caffeine and why do we pick on caffeine? Well, caffeine is actually a diuretic. And I remember having an argument with a doctor once um, about caffeine. Uh, and he was like, it, it doesn't dehydrate you. Well, if it acts as a diuretic and you're already having struggles in taking fluids, then I do call it a dehydrator. <laughs> so I think I kind of won, won the fight in my own head anyway. So excessive caffeine is defined as greater than 400 milligrams of caffeine. So what's really weird about it is that you might be drinking your coffee and you're thinking, okay, this is a fluid. How am I not hydrating from it? Well, if it has a lot of caffeine in it, it's going to act as a diuretic and then you're going to have increased urinary output and then you're not going to be able to catch up. So this is just a chart to show you that it can rack up pretty quickly. I mean, I have a lot of my friends and family and patients that go to Starbucks like every single day. And look at this one, just, you know, a 20 fluid ounce of regular coffee is already over what we recommend for caffeine per day. It has 415, you know, so just, just look at these numbers. It really does start to add up. Okay, so today I did have a Dunkin' Donuts coffee but it was decaf, <laughs> so it didn't, it had very little caffeine in it. So I'm actually counting mine as fluid. Um, so just take a look at this. You can get these kinds of numbers online. You know, you can always type it in whatever you drink and see, you know, how much caffeine is in this particular product just to, to give you an idea. 
And the same thing even with tea. I mean, tea is definitely lower than coffee, but you know, if you're getting, all right, maybe not this awake one, but just say you're getting an Earl Grey and you're drinking four a day, well, that's gonna add up, right? So just remember that excessive caffeine you know, is not so good for our hydration level. So if you're gonna drink your coffee, just make sure you're drinking your water or your beverages other than caffeinated beverages in between. Some of these drinks too get me very nervous, especially, um, you know, if we're trying to drink them for extra energy, you know, it's got that extra shot of caffeine in, in there and then it could dehydrate you. And even some of the over-the-counter pills that we take we can't even forget that even, you know, aspirin over the counter can have caffeine in it. So it does all add up. And then the other thing I wanted to just mention is what can dehydrate you as well? Well, sodium intake, because when you look at the biochemistry of the body, water is always going to follow salt. All right. So the more salt and sodium you eat, the more water, hopefully you're going to be drinking, right? Just because it's going to it's going to pull fluids from your eyes. So that's why sometimes if you have a real salty meal, um, the very next day you're almost swollen. Like you can't put on your rings or you know, your socks feel tighter. And that's because the water is following that sodium and kind of leaking out of the cells. I just wanted to show you this, just it, it doesn't take much to add a lot of salt to your diet, especially if you're doing any kind of processed foods or, you know, canned soups and things like that, because obviously it's going to have more sodium in it. But if you're using the salt shaker, that adds up quick too. Look at this, one teaspoon, 20 grams hot. So the American Heart Association recommends that if you do have high blood pressure um, to kind of stay within the range of 1200 to 1500 milligrams per day, we still need sodium. It is an important electrolyte, so it's impossible to go to zero, but you do want to keep control on that. And then if you don't have any high blood pressure issues or heart issues, we could probably go up to about 2300 milligrams per day. But I can tell you as a conservative I don't really promote going even that high um, just because, you know, that's going to lead to 2,500 milligrams and 3,000 milligrams. And the average American eats about 4,500 milligrams of sodium per day, which is a lot. You got to read your labels. And I know the food labels just get so confusing. You know, um, if you have, if you pick up, just say you pick up a can of peas, try to get the sodium free or the low sodium. You know, um, I hardly ever see very low sodium anymore. But when you look at a low sodium product, it just means that there's 140 milligrams of sodium or less per serving. Whereas something that was regular, it might, it might be 200 or 300 milligrams of sodium per serving. Sodium free just means that it's gonna have less than five milligrams of sodium per serving. Um, I know a lot of those things would have to be uh, more flavorful. I remember, uh, I think it was the other day, I made myself some broth and the broth was a sodium free. Oh my goodness, it had absolutely no flavor. I might as well have just used water, seriously. So now the next time I know I've got to really spice it up with non-sodium herbs and other spices to really make it tasty because it can definitely be pretty bland. Um, but these are just ways that you can decrease your sodium because things add up quickly. Almost every single food has a natural source of sodium. I mean, even if you had healthy foods, you know, like your cottage cheese and your yogurt, and even if you're eating a salad, you're putting salad dressing on it. And just naturally, um, fruits and vegetables have sodium in them as well, like celery. So that's why you just have to put a little bit of a control on it. All right, so alcohol, I won't dwell on the alcohol, but why does alcohol actually cause dehydration? Well, it's the way it's metabolized in the body and the way it has to get out of the body. So it requires a lot of enzymes. It requires a whole different metabolic cycle in your body. It requires the function of your liver and your kidneys. So it really has to filter a lot. So there's a lot of biochemistry to get the alcohol 
out of your system and that can cause dehydration and that's why that hangover you might feel in the morning is is due to the fact that you're dehydrated so you know the little trick that we used to do in college right you drink but then right before you go to bed you're supposed to have about 16 ounces of water and hopefully you won't have that hangover the next morning so just remember just you know if we're having our our tasty alcohol just keep it within the dietary guidelines for Americans, one drink per day for women and up to two drinks per day for men. Um, but don't count it as your fluid. <laughs> so don't say, okay, well, I'm drinking alcohol, so that's going to contribute to my fluid. No. So take a look at what your fluid intake actually is per day. What are you drinking? What's the quality of the fluids and the foods that you're eating? Are you, you know, all day drinking caffeinated coffee and then at night you're having a drink? Well, guess what? You're going to dehydrate, right? So of course, I'm not a pharmacist or an MD, so this is not an exclusive list, but I just wanted to give you an example of some medications that can cause dehydration. I know we mentioned some of the over-the-counter meds, um, but if you're on any kind of diuretic, a diuretic is something that helps to bring down blood pressure, or if you're on something called an ACE inhibitor, which is for your heart, um, you know, a lot of these, what they do is they try to get the fluids out of your body. You're urinating a lot or you're trying to push these fluids out of your body, you actually have to replenish that fluid. And it almost, again, seems so counterintuitive, like, okay, I'm trying to get rid of the fluids. Why would I put more fluids in my body? Well, you need to do that so you don't dehydrate from the mere fact that these diuretics push excessive fluids out of different spaces in your body. Um, laxatives, that would make sense too. Um, certainly if you're taking a laxative and then it causes diarrhea, uh-oh, that's going to be a bigger problem. Um, diabetic meds can also cause dehydration, especially that metformin. Over-the-counter meds, things that have caffeine. Uh, vitamins and minerals, anything that actually hydrates you. And acids. Well, that kind of makes sense, right? Like Tums and all these Rolades and things like that. What do they do to function? They soak up fluids. They soak up acids. So they're actually dehydrators. Antihistamines, well, that makes sense too, right? You're sneezing, you have a runny nose, so you take an antihistamine that dries you up. <laughs> it dehydrates you. So you've got to drink water or drink some sort of hydration. And then others others do. You always put in other category, right? So again, not an exclusive list, but if you are taking medications, I always say this to you, always talk to your pharmacist to find out, well, what are some of the interactions of these meds? You know, do I have to drink more water? Do I have to take it on an empty stomach? You always want to be aware of it. Um, some doctors might not give you the full instruction on it, so definitely rely on your pharmacist for that. Just some other tips to be aware, just just be aware of how you're feeling, um, plan things. If you know you're gonna be out and about, if you know obviously you're gonna be working out, you know, just be prepared. Um, also build a routine as well. I mean, some of my most successful patients for whatever their goals are, they always start the day with a glass of water. So it's not that, oh, let me go get coffee first. No, they're always starting with water. That's just such a great thing. Try not to wait until you actually feel thirsty because you act, if you feel thirsty, you're already dehydrated. It's already your brain telling you, okay, I'm not happy. I'm already dehydrated. And what's interesting is as we get older and actually certain surgeries actually take away that feeling of thirst. So if you don't even know you're thirsty and then you're not drinking, then it's really going to slam you over the head because you're not going to feel good because all these electrolytes are going crazy in your body. Always check the color and odor of your urine. That's a sure sign as well. Assess the moisture in your mouth and your eyes. You know, definitely dry mouth is, is a big thing too, especially if you're on medications. Um, make sure your beverages are easy to reach, like I said. Try not to skip meals. And of course, the food that you include, try to have that high fluid content. So fruits, vegetables, things with sauces, soups, all of that counts towards your fluid intake. I think the only thing here for... Um, my clients that do a lot of smoothies and protein shakes, because they're smoothies and they have yogurt and milk and things like that, although that's a fluid, you have to remember it also has protein and things like that. So I usually count it as half the fluid. So for example, if you're drinking a protein shake that is 10 ounces, count that as five ounces towards your fluid intake. 
I know that sounds like a bit arbitrary, but I want to take the other five ounces towards digestion. And then definitely be creative. See what you like. I have um, certain patients that like uh, thicker textures. They don't like thinner textures, you know, different flavors, different sweeteners, things like that. I mean, come on, be inventive. And definitely self-monitor. You know, I know I always have that message in whatever I talk about. Whatever your goals are, you have to self-monitor yourself to see if you're meeting that goal. Um, whether it's weight loss or drinking enough or exercising, you've got to self-monitor to know that you're reaching your goal and know where you need to improve. So to help you out a little bit, oh, I, I have a slide on a bunch of um, apps. So I'll show you that shortly. So how much water should we actually um, drink? So when you look at different, you know, associations like sports medicine and things like that, it's, it's gonna vary, but I like to go by how much you weigh because that kind of makes sense. You know, my friend who's 90 pounds probably doesn't need as much fluid as me who's 150 pounds. That just makes sense, right? Just because of body composition. So this is why I like this chart. So if you, you know, are 160 pounds, 180 pounds, you're within that 64 to 72 ounces. And the more weight you have, the more fluids you actually need to support the body that you are carrying around with you. So that would just make sense. And then of course, always include in here your activity because if you're losing the fluids, you gotta add more to it. So that's why I like this chart. So when should we actually drink water? Well, I think first thing in the morning, that's the best way to drink it. Start hydrating as soon as you get up in the morning, especially if now we have to take medications, right? Um, but if you're actually exercising, the American College of Sports Medicine says to avoid dehydration, we should drink at least 16 to 20 ounces of fluid one to two hours before any outdoor activity. And I guarantee if you do that, you will actually have a better competition. <laughs> so if you're playing tennis, you're gonna win that day because you're actually properly hydrated, your muscles are gonna work better, your heart is beating better, you're just healthier, you're oxygenating better. So it's really going to affect your performance as well. After that, you should consume six to 12 ounces of fluid every 10 to 15 minutes when you're outside. So when you're, you know, taking that set break or, you're, you know, you're walking to the next hole, make sure you're drinking that water and then, or fluid. And then when you're finished with the activity, you should drink more. So you got to replace what you lost. So drink another 16 to 24 ounces or two to three cups. So this again are the requirements for when you're exercising, especially outside when you're losing fluids. Um, and it's going to help not just your performance, but keep you hydrated and out of the danger zone of dehydration. These are the apps that I was talking about. And I think most of them are free. I think some of them have a small charge, but just play around with them. Um, you know, I love apps because then you can set goals, you can set timers. There's, you know, usually a blog and a community. They're just a lot of fun. So these are like the top few that are used. Um, some of my clients use them as well. So, so I don't know, download them, play around with it, start self-monitoring, take a look at it. You can see different trends. Um, and then you can also see, you know, how do you feel that day? Or if you're competing, did you do better that day because you drank more? So it's just really just a lot of fun, some stuff that we can do to kind of get to our goals. So I hope I've imparted that dehydration can definitely be deadly. It can really hurt your health. Uh, the best treatment is always prevention. Um, but be careful because dehydration can strike at any time. Be, um, be aware of circumstances that can increase your risk. So remember, it can happen anytime, anywhere. And remember that hydrating doesn't just mean water. I think water is one of the best things just because we are at least 50% water. But eat hydrating foods and drink fluids that you tolerate the best that you'll be able to hydrate yourself with and uh, you know apply your daily strategies like to keep you on track if you enjoyed it I, of course i always end my presentations with my sons <laughs> and i hope everybody's good so tell me any questions for me Oh, it's a quiet group. Oh, no, I have a question. Hi. Tell me. Okay, go. 
Um, I want to, yeah, I saw the uh, infused water with all uh -huh. the lemons and oranges and everything, uh -huh. and berries, uh -huh. and most of those were made with fruits that are acidic, and uh -huh. with acid reflux, I'm trying to reduce the acid intake. Right. I saw watermelon was there and all that, but uh -huh. the other things, but that just blew my mind. It was so uh -huh. intuitive. Well, you know, what's really interesting is that lemon, even though it's a citrus fruit, when you eat lemon or put it in salad and such, it doesn't, um, it doesn't, um, what do you call it, dilute. But there's actually some research to show that when you put lemon in water because of the chemical reaction between H2O and the pH of lemon, it actually makes it into an alkaline water. So you can try it, but if you're nervous about it, then what I would say, let's just pick some other um, herbs and other vegetables maybe. So let's do that, you know. Um, go ahead, what were you gonna say? Well, I, I a couple of years ago, I had been drinking uh, some water in the morning with a slice of lemon in it, you know, uh -huh. like, uh, lukewarm, just for health reasons. And then, you know, when I got, information on acid reflux and so I, I had to eliminate lemon from my diet lemon mm -hmm. um, juice and oranges and tomatoes and all I just sort of haven't had any of those things since yeah well you know when when um, the dietary treatment for reflux and heartburn would be to take out very acidic foods especially if you're eating them if you're diluting them, it might be a little bit different. But if you're still trying to treat your acid reflux, then I would say be conservative and keep the lemon out. That's okay. There are plenty of other fruits and vegetables that okay. we can use to infuse the water. Yep. Will do. So I always have yeah. to have the fruits. Yeah, for sure. You know, like maybe blueberries. Blueberry water. Have you tried that? Yeah. Or raspberries? Yeah, aren't uh, berries supposed to be acidic? Not blueberries. Some of the strawberries can be. Um, yeah. Raspberries. What's interesting about raspberries, the acidic is that they actually have like salicylic acid in them, <laughs> almost like an aspirin. So that's why those are acidic. So I think you do have to just play around with it. But remember, you're diluting it. Diluting this. I mean, this recipe is five cups of water. So right. if you're, you know, you're you're diluting it a lot, and it's all about the chemistry. So. You know, it, but like I said, if you are nervous about it, then just stick to the, the fruits and vegetables. No, don't irritate your stomach. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, hi, I have a comment about dehydration. Hi, Barbara. Hi. hi. Um, I remember visiting an aunt of mine who was in an assisted living facility. Yeah. yeah. And the nurse came in and touched, pressed in on her cheek a little bit. Mm -hmm. And said you're dehydrated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That the I guess it would if it doesn't pop up right away when you press in if it left that indentation. That's what she was using okay. as a guide. Well, the better guide is not the indentation because if you press on the skin and it stays that way, that could actually be called edema. Okay, so from a nutrition point of view, what we do is we don't press in; we pull. I know that sounds funny. I know you probably can't you see what? I didn't hear you. Pull, you pull the skin up and if it stays up and together. Well, maybe she did that. <laughs> that yeah, that, that she probably did that. No, I wasn't watching that. her that closely. Yeah, yeah. And, and it is true. It's all part of that, you know, uh, visual and physical assessment that you might do on a patient. So pressing actually tries to indicate if a patient has edema, right? Um, pinching. And if it stays up or the skin sticks together, that means that you're dehydrated or potentially dehydrated. Yeah. Whatever she was doing, she was doing something. I know to her cheek. Pinch, pinching it. Yep. Maybe. Yep. You, maybe yeah, pinching. you can do that. Even do that. I do that drugs all the time to make sure they're not dehydrated because it's the same concept <laughs> on living creatures. They look at me like I'm crazy, but you know. <laughs> But yes, you can do it that way too. But hey, I don't want to wait till that happens. So just prevent right. it. Yeah. yeah. But thank you for that comment. A another comment. I'm yeah. here in New Jersey where mm -hmm. we have extremely hard water. Extremely. Ugh. A lot of yeah. calcium. Water. Yeah. So we have a water softener for the whole house. 
with the exception of the kitchen sink. The cold water in the kitchen sink is hard water. Mm -hmm. Because supposedly that's much healthier than drinking the softened water through a softener. Right. And well, it's what you're it, saying. There's a high calcium. The pH is very high on, the, on our cold yeah, water. Yeah, it's high. I mean, you know, what's really interesting is that, you know, obviously when we're drinking water and we're, you know, filtrating in one section and not in another section, hopefully that's becoming a balance too. I mean, are you drinking the tap water from the kitchen? You're actually drinking it? Well, I boil it every morning and put in, make my coffee that way with the mm -hmm. cold, with the tap water, with the, tap with, water. With the hardened water. Of course, yeah. you know, you, you can't imagine what it does to the tea kettle, the bottom of the yeah, tea kettle. Yeah, it's true. It's white, you know, I have to put vinegar in it every once in a while and yep. get rid of all that uh, yep. Yep. calcium. But then yep. you concern, does that happen in your body, that calcium that's stuck in the bottom of the tea kettle, for example? Or well, in your pipes, if it's, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a really great question. Think about it. It's almost like you're having, you know, like a glass of milk. I mean, calcium is a mineral that our body is going to absorb. Here's the thing, though. We need so much calcium. We need, you know, 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams a day. I doubt you're getting that much from your tea kettle and your water. So I think it's just contributing to maybe the calcium that you're in taking from your food and beverage. It's the same thing if you, if you use like um, a cast iron pan, you're getting iron from that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we are going to get, you know, we are going to get, you know, different minerals from vitamins and minerals from the foods and beverages that we drink. It doesn't seem like it would be such a problem, but you know, what's interesting, part of a wellness checkup should always be checking your bones. You know, the, the doctor is going to do a CMP, which includes calcium, but that doesn't really tell you if your bones are being protected. So you can always get a bone density test. I mean, that's, that's really the surefire way to see right. if you're getting too much calcium or not enough calcium. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. Any other questions? No, just another comment. Yeah. I, I've learned about myself. I cannot drink water, and I mm -hmm. discovered why. Uh -huh. I don't like anything cold. Oh, that's interesting. Well, okay. Anything. That's okay. I don't drink any soda. I don't drink anything cold. Uh -huh. So I learned I could drink water if I just boil it, for right. example. I don't, I, I boil it and maybe put in like a little, a touch of a tea bag kind of thing or yeah. a touch of de, uh, instant decaf coffee, like a little bit that just colors yeah. the water and it's warm and I yeah. can drink it. But cold, I just go. have trouble with cold. You know, and I learned and, and that with I, ice, I, it's yeah. worse. Wow. You know, I've just the opposite of a lot of my other people who need that ice. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting is that room temperature and warmer kind of water will absorb quicker through the stomach. So maybe that's the comfort that you're feeling. Whereas cold, you know, that that's hitting your stomach and it actually stays there longer. So that's why it's uncomfortable. I don't know. I just know that one way I like it and one way I don't. So. Hey, then go for it. You drink it the way that you tolerate it the best. It looks like you already found your strategy. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good job. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I actually have a patient. She she's a patient. She did surgery on her stomach and she was not able to drink anything except hot water for about two months. That's all her stomach would accept. Now she can drink different things, but you know, it is about physiology and chemistry. You know, that's basically what we are. So so you found your strategy. I personally can't drink water. Water actually makes me physically sick. I've been to um, a gastroenterologist to find out uh, what's going on with water. And it just, it, it almost gives me diarrhea. It's almost like a laxative when I drink water. It's horrible. So, That's unusual. Yeah. And it, it is, it's almost like I have an allergy to it. But if I, you know, put, put tea in it or coffee, that's no problem. It's just straight water. So I've tried different alkaline water. And basically what they said my condition was is that I have a very acidic stomach. So um, the water actually tries to dilute the acids, but it goes into my intestines too quickly. And then I also have a very fast moving system. 
So I thought I was such a weirdo, like, oh my goodness, I can't drink water. And then I realized that there's a whole club of people Isn't that, something? that, yeah, that also has a hard time with water. So it's, it wasn't as unusual as I thought. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Maybe that's why I like the warm water with a little bit of that coffee in it or a yeah. little bit of tea in it. Maybe. And I love it. You're hydrating. So go for it. All right, you guys, any other yeah. comments or questions? Oh, okay, you guys. Well, that was a lot of fun. Thank you for inviting me to your home today. And, and thank I, you. Oh, you're very thank welcome. You very My pleasure, you guys. So just be safe and I'll see you next month and um, be well, okay? You, you too. too. Thanks, guys. I have some Bye. new water recipes. All right. Thank you. Let, Thank let me know you. how it goes. <laughs> okay, then. Bye. And I'm Bye. not crazy Bye. when I tell the waiters, no ice water, please. <laughs> you go, no, water. You're not crazy. <laughs> they look at me. Are you sure? <laughs> yes, you're sure. Yes, I am. <laughs> All right, you guys. Okay. Have a good evening. Thank you. You All too. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye, Jillian. -bye. Bye -bye. <laughs>